I am very uncomfortable being above uh, most of you on this stage. I plan to come down shortly. And uh, let me just say that uh, I am Daniel, like it says up here, and this is my first visit to Israel. And uh, to say I am enjoying Israel uh, with Roberta, my wife, is a complete understatement. It's been just a nonstop learning experience for us. And uh, the people here are unlike any. I've met anywhere in the world, and I'm just so enjoying our visit here, and I feel so honored by the conference um, arrangers and executors, Agile Sparks, and the entire team. So, <laughs> it's such a pleasure to be with you, and such an honor to be able to present what I consider to be currently my best ideas based on my current beliefs about some things that you may find provocative, right? So, um, one of the things we're trying to do in these Agile adoptions is actually improve the results. We're supposed to be about continuous improvement, and I think many of us aspire to this, yet we don't, we don't know where the levers are or where the tools are. And certainly, leadership is a big part of that, and I don't mean hierarchical leadership or bureaucracy. I mean leadership in all its forms. The two primary forms of leadership are the formal, authorized by the organization, and the informal, authorized by the people and the team members. And this is your street credibility or the respect that you get. Uh, what people say about you, your reputation, this is the informal authority that you, you have. So I hope to teach something about this. And um, the goal is to create a place where there's a lot of engagement. So where people want to come to work every day excited and passionate and responsible to bring their best authentic whole selves to work each and every day and to feel nothing of a division between work and play that it's all one thing okay so play is a dirty word in the workplace yet play is the source of all innovation so how can we as leaders create innovation through play serious play play that is actually very, very important, right? So the theme of our conference is modern agile beyond, getting beyond the agile theater. So I want to give you some tools that I believe support modern agility and also, you know, uh, in service to moving beyond theater, a mere, mere uh, production of a drama, right? Into something real. So that's the point here. Okay, so... I hope you'll imagine with me a future of work where leaders, where leaders develop new skills for a new economy, an economy where, where many people are engaged in knowledge creation and knowledge work, and they're not taking anything, they're not buying anything you're selling unless they authorize it. And this is especially true in software development and any complex product development. So, in my previous talk this morning, I talked about how the, the hypothesis of this talk and the talk this morning was that engagement gets you everything that you want from your Agile adoption. That without engagement, you have nothing but Agile theater. And with, if you have disengagement, you're just pretending. If the people are engaged, if they're passionate and responsible, Everything good that you're measuring goes up. Everything you say you want, you obtain. That's the hypothesis of this talk, that engagement is essential. So if there's anybody who, um, and I'm not here to argue that. I'm stating it as an empirical fact. So if this is not something you currently believe, this is not the talk for you. However, if you're looking for engagement, I'm going to show you how to get it. So we only have 50 minutes. I want to go through these slides. And like I said, I'm completely uncomfortable with the slides. And you actually are going to help me to structure this talk. So let me begin. Our goals, as I propose them, are to identify the concepts and facilities of invitation, specifically leadership invitation, and to learn about something called invitation-based change, and to be able to apply some, some techniques and some skills around invitation in a leadership context right now. And lastly, to locate and access resources that will uh, lead you towards more learning 
on your own at a time of your choosing. Are these all acceptable learning uh, objectives for us in the next 45 minutes or so? If you agree, say yes. I can't hear you. Can Yes? Okay. All right. Here we go. So here I am. I'm an Agile coach of 10 years. I'm a competent coach of four years. So I think I learn more than anyone else in the coaching. I, I pretend to teach other people. The reality is that I learn more at each coaching engagement. Um, I'm the author of a book called The Culture Game. You can find it on Amazon. And I'm the co-author of a book called The Open Space Agility Handbook. I'm also a kind of a troublemaker. And some would say a heretic with respect to agile dogma. So my ideas are not for everyone, but maybe they're for you. So who or what is authorizing me? Obviously, I'm here on some authority. I'm before you today, hundreds of you at the closing of a very important conference in Israel. Where do I get my authority from? Well, the conference organizers have actually authorized me to be here. So it's on their authority that I'm here. But that's not actually enough. So I have a question for you. Are you willing to allow me to lead you through some learning in the next 40 minutes? Because without your authorization, my job is done here. What do you say? Okay. Now that I've been duly authorized, we can proceed. So, we agree to end on time. My understanding is that at 17.00, uh, this is, my talk is over. Is that correct? Okay, so this may actually end a little earlier. That depends on you, as we'll see in a minute, because you are going to help me to understand what to do next. We agree that during the exercises, when I raise my hand, that you, when you see me raise my hand, will raise your hand and face the front. Is that fair? Okay, and then we're going to move through up to six exercises. These are, this is entirely up to you. Okay, so I need you to suspend your disbelief and pretend and act as if everything I say is true. Now, I know this is difficult for many of us. We're left brain, problem solving, highly intelligent, engineering types. I want you to pretend like a child that what I'm saying is true. Just follow along and play with me and pretend that what I say actually works. Fair? Okay, is there anybody who does not want to play? Let's make it, oh, there's a, there's, a, there's a fellow in the back raising his hand. Let's just say that if any time you're not getting the learning that you want or you're not contributing enough here in your opinion, you're, you're perfectly welcome and invited to, to leave. It's no insult to me. Fair? Okay. So, at the end of this talk, everyone will receive the gift of this book. I co-authored with four other authors called the Open Space Agility Handbook. And I'll give you the exact instructions at the end. The people at the end will receive the exact instructions, and the people not present will not. Okay, so now let's discuss the title of my talk, Leadership as an Invitation Art. I think we must first define our terms. What is leadership? What is invitation? And what is art? So let's proceed. Without definitions, we have nothing. All definitions are agreements. If we can agree on definitions, we've made a small micro agreement. This is the basis of more complex agreements. So let's define our small definitions. For invitation, here it is. A written or verbal request that tests the willingness of someone to go somewhere or do something and is respectful of any response, even remotely similar to, no, thank you. This means we won't chase them, ask them why about the no, or anything like this. We will respect the no. That's what a genuine invitation does. And in my opinion, the ability to do this well is the future of leadership and the future of work. This has applicability far beyond agile adoptions, but it's especially useful here. Leadership? Hmm, that's interesting. Let's take a step back for a moment and just 
pause on that and instead define art. This comes directly from Google. The expression or application of human creative skill and imagination. So we are going to make art with leadership through the use of invitation. And now, for leadership, I'd like you to turn to the person next to you and give them your definition of leadership. And then when you listen, they talk, you ask them if they're complete, and then it's your turn to go. Find someone next to you. Tell them your definition of leadership. Take about 90 seconds to do that, and please watch for when I raise my hand. Go. Okay, start to wrap it up. Okay. All right, we have some good agreements here. It's good. Okay. So as it turns out, there's many definitions of leadership. Many definitions. Most of them are correct. I offer you this definition as we go forward. It's a challenging definition intended to provoke you. The act of helping to shape, form, and execute the decisions, the decisions that affect the group as a whole. This means that whether you're a formal or informally authorized leader, if you help shape, form, and execute the decisions that affect a group of people, you are in fact leading. Okay, so I ask you to suspend your disbelief and pretend that this definition is true. Fair? Okay. Invitation. Joshua this morning, when we discussed modern agile, he talked about respect for people and continuous improvement, the pillars, the fundamental pillars, the timeless principles of lean. Invitation is fundamentally respectful when it respects the no. Therefore, invitation is, is an extremely respectful way to lead because it's respectful of people's personal boundaries. What if you made all your meetings optional? You, made, you invited people, and they didn't come, and you didn't chase them. What would, you, what would you conclude from the data? Well, maybe your invitation is not well formed, or maybe the content of your meeting is not that interesting, or maybe people feel safe enough to say no. You know, in IT, nobody gets fired for saying yes. Have you noticed this? Will it be ready? Will we ship by September 1st? We will ship by September 1st, right? Yes. Why? Because yes doesn't get you fired, but no can get you fired. So in, in, in the IT world, we are very, very good at saying yes. This is a fundamental flaw in IT. 
it forces us to be unprofessional and to actually compromise our own values at work. So respecting the no becomes very, very important if you're going to execute on invitation as a leadership art. Invitation triggers decision making. Decision making is the root of all engagement. If you're not deciding, it's easy to be disengaged. If you have to decide, it's hard to be disengaged. Invitation triggers a yes or a no. So please sus suspend your disbelief and consider the following statement true. There's no such thing as a successful agile change program without hi extremely high levels of human engagement. So the real question is, how do we get it? If engagement is the secret sauce, how do we do it? We do it through invitation. This is the primary way to generate tremendous levels of engagement. If I, don't, if I say no, what will I miss? If I say no, who else said yes? I will be out of the yes group and in the no group if I say no. If I say yes, what will I learn? Will it be worth my time? Is it a good use of my time? Decision making. An invitation presents an option. Now let's have an exercise. Here it is. The, the, this, this presentation is now in your hands. Find someone near you and discuss which you prefer. More lecture or more activities. The way you vote pivots the entire presentation. Please spend a minute each. Proceed. One minute to go. Okay, I like Israel. Israel is very orderly. Okay, so how many people want more lecture? That's a lot. How many people want more exercises? Oh, I think we need a debate now. This looks very even. Exercises. Lecture. Oh, the lectures have it. I think. Let's go again. Lectures. Activities. <laughs> okay, notice the activities are now adding an audio dimension. <laughs> this is very interesting. Okay, so we will go 60-40 uh, lecture and exercise. Okay, how's that? All right, here we go. So here's the first, here's the first coaching on invitation, okay? Have you ever received an invitation that's hard to respond to? You don't know what's being asked. 
You ever, ever have that happen to you? They invite you, but you're not quite sure what it means. Like, my people must call your people and do lunch. Yeah. That's not an invitation, okay? That's a vague expectation that's going nowhere, okay? So here's what I want you to do. I want you to structure your invitation as a game. Every game has four properties. Every game has a clear goal. Every game has very clear, uniformly applied rules. If it's a good one, crappy games have crappy, hard to understand rules that not everyone understands or even is aware of, okay? This is the basis of the entire Dilbert comic strip. Clear goals, clear rules, and thirdly, a clear way to be able to track progress. The hypothesis is we are all addicts for progress. We are junkies for progress. Progress is extremely important to all people. And lastly, opt-in participation. You issue the invitation and respect the no. Okay, so if you structure your invitation as a game, it's easier to respond to. It's easier to understand, it's easier to compile, and it's easier to execute on the yes or the no. Okay, so here's a sample invitation, a very plain English thing, very simple. You are invited to dinner at my home. We will have six courses and eight different wines. We plan to enjoy very fine food, finer wine, and even finer conversation. We plan to start at 6.30 and end at 10.30. Beforehand, I will send an email listing everyone who is coming to dinner. I do, need your, I do need to know, not later than Thursday, regarding your intent to attend. I hope you can make it. Now, here's a very simple, plain English invitation that has all the properties of a good game. The goal is embedded in there. The rules are clear. The way to track progress is through the food and the wines and the expiration of time. So it's not as hard as it sounds. It's actually very easy. Let's try. Turn to someone near you and by agreement and in turn, issue an invitation, something after the conference or maybe next week. And if you, don't, if you can't do that because you're from far away, then make it a simulated thing like going to breakfast or having a beer or something. Okay, be sure to structure your invite as a good game. Clearly specify the three things. The goal, which is the aim or objective. The rules, which is the constraints or the, you know, the, 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 the rules of the game. And then, how you're going to track the progress. Okay, go ahead and take 90 seconds each. Take a shot at invitation as a very good game. Okay, thank you. Okay, so that wasn't too hard. Clearly structured invitation is a very easy thing to respond to. But why do you care? Why do you care? Well, if you want to be effective in the world, you can't do it alone. You need other people. People are naturally curious, especially about a game. Everyone likes a good game, so structure your invitation as a game, and perhaps you'll be more effective in the world, even with your own children. Everyone wants a sense of control. Everyone wants a sense of progress. We talked about the addiction to progress, the addiction, or like how we're like junkies for progress. You know, we talk about control as control freak. Actually, that's a very derisive term. From the time we're two years old, we struggle for control. Why? Because control feels good when you know where the levers are. We know that this talk ends at 17.00. That gives you a sense of control. 
It's part of the rules of the game we're playing right now. Likewise, because we all agree, we all belong to the agreement about when this ends. And if I do my job well, it needs to end before 17.00. The sense of progress goes back to the original goal about the learning objectives. Either we're meeting those objectives or we're not. So, invitations structured as good games deliver these essential human needs. Heidi talked about not forgetting the humans. Josh talked about, in his Modern Agile talk, about, you know, making it safe for people to actually say what they think and feel. That includes no. So invitations deliver these things, okay? So let's talk a little bit about the future of work. The work today, once people are making money, they can go anywhere and they're going to go get their needs met beyond money in lots of other places. And your competitors are going to hire away your best people. Your best people have options. They will walk because they can. So the real question is, how are you leading? I submit to you that the future of work includes invitation as a leadership art. People do what they're willing to do, and they, do, they don't do what they're unwilling to do. The Dilbert Strip has the, a strip called the Bad Donuts. Has anyone ever seen this one? The Bad Donuts. It goes like this. It's in the book, The Dilbert Principle, if you have that book. It basically says, if you're going to a meeting, and it's your boss's meeting, and your boss wants you to bring the donuts, and you don't want to bring the donuts, bring donuts that nobody likes. That's a no. But it's a very passive slash passive aggressive no because nobody gets fired for saying yes. So I say yes to bring the donuts and I bring donuts nobody likes. This is the reality of the workplace today. So imagine if we could actually tell the truth about what we want, think, and feel. And what if we were trusted, like it says in many principles around Agile, to give people the support and environment they need and trust them to get the job done? What if we allowed people to allocate their scarce time and attention on the job to where they thought it could do the most good for the company? That's the future of work. So I'm going to issue some challenges to you in a few more slides. Josh talked about psychological safety. It's very difficult to imagine psychological safety where invitation is not present. If everything has to be a yes, how is this safe? Agile adoptions being exhibit A in my argument. Agile adoptions today are mandates. Here's another little exercise. Find someone you do not know. Turn to them and by agreement and in turn disclose the following information. Have any genuine invitations been issued whatsoever? in your Agile adoption in the past six months? That's a yes or no answer. There is not a maybe there. And secondly, on a scale of one to 10, where 10 being the this is the greatest thing I've ever experienced, and one being this is more messed up than anything I've ever experienced, rate your Agile adoption. Let's just take a minute to do that. Go ahead, ask those two questions to someone you do not know, and then let, when you're done, Signal you're complete and have them go. Take one minute to do that.
<laughs> Thank you. I'm so sorry to speed us up. We have about 15 minutes to go and that's it. We have an agreement to end on time, do we not? Okay, so let's take a look at invitation and pull. Everyone loves pull in the agile world. Pull is a wonderful thing. There's virtue in pull. In Kanban, we pull the work in. After we meet our work and process limit and we de decrement it by one, we pull more work from the queue. In Scrum, we pull from the product backlog into the sprint backlog. Pull is full of virtue. Pull is, one of the, is the secret sauce. Yet, we're busy implementing Agile as push. Here's an idea. When you issue invitations as a leader and they say no, reduce the ask by half. Here's a story for you. One time I was coaching with uh, a team and I asked the team, do you think we could maybe get through some of these estimates like in about 10 minutes? We could maybe do six in an hour? And they looked at me and they're like, no. And there I was. I had no idea what I was going to say next. And I looked at them and I said, how about three then? And here's what they said. No. This was very comical. And I'm like, well, I'm going to go further with this. I said, how about two? They looked at each other there. Mm, no. So <laughs> I laughed out loud and I went like this with my arms. And I went, how about one? And they looked at each other and they went, okay, we'll do one. And that was the beginning of this. So when you issue an invitation, respect the no, and when they say no, reduce the ask by half. And make sure your invitation is well formed. When you invite, you're going to receive a lot of data as a leader about who's in, who's out, what they want, what they don't want, what the, what the team's ready for, what the department's ready for, what the division is ready for, what the enterprise is ready for. Before you go and spend $500,000 on your Agile adoption, wouldn't it be a good idea to find out what the willingness of the organization is regarding intent to proceed? Invitation is your ticket to that data. The hypothesis of invitation-based change is that we can get the resistant people to become tolerant. We can get the tolerant people perhaps to become supporting by merely suspending their disbelief by offering them an option to write the story about the change, okay? We're trying to eliminate resistance so we get everyone to try something, get some experience, and then pull information out of us in the form of questions. This is 10 times better than pushing lectures or pushing a procedure or pushing a practice. In the Agile community, we're going to take a tremendous leap forward when this invitation-based change takes root. I would like nothing more than for it to start in Israel. What a fantastic vision that is. What if Israel led out across the entire world regarding the next thing in Agile? You might be thinking, people who know nothing need to be told about how to do good Agile. You're right. There's only one problem. You never ask them. So they're going to bring really bad donuts. That's what's going to happen. They're going to bring bad donuts to the daily scrum. They're going to bring bad donuts to the sprint planning. They're going to bring bad donuts to the retrospective. If you want bad donuts, just tell people what to do. The shuhari thing, yeah, they're in the shoe stage. They know nothing. But, you know, this comes from the martial arts. And people in martial arts dojos are there by consent. They're there because they want to be there, because they opt into submitting to being led through learning by the, by the sensei. Okay? This doesn't happen in our organizations. So, yeah, they're in the shoe stage, but they're, you're, you're forcing it on them. Is it any surprise they're not interested that they bring the bad donuts. So, in invitation-based change, the leaders name the direction. That is the duty and obligation of leaders, not just the privilege. Likewise, leaders name the constraints. 
or the guardrails or the limits or the rules of the road. So we name a direction, we, we specify the, the, the width of the road, and then we leave it to people to figure out how to get there. Okay, so we, we, we define the why, we define the what, and we leave the how to the people. Why? Because deciding is what triggers engagement, people. If, if we're not, if all the practices are all, all defined and we've answered all the questions as leaders, there's no decisions to make, there's not going to be any engagement. So it's going to be, you'll have no one to blame but yourself when your agile adoption crashes and burns. A really important part of invitation-based change is leadership storytelling. I'm here to tell you right now, if you're a leader in an organization and you're bringing Agile to your company, and your people are engaging in experiments, and they're failing, and you're not celebrating that, you're, you're in for a world of hurt. If your people are identifying impediments, and you're ignoring those, and you're not telling stories about how the discoveries of these impediments is exactly what we want, you have no one to blame but yourself when your agile adoption becomes the most disengaged thing you've ever seen. And you know how this looks in the daily scrum, right? It's people looking at their shoes. We've all seen this. You got, how many people here are agile coaches? All right, then you folks know. All you have to do is go to a couple daily scrums. You know the whole story, right? Yeah, because the engagement level or the lack of it is, is manifest. It's evident. It's obvious. So what we're trying to do is create signaling that creates safety. Signaling that creates safety. That's what leadership storytelling is. When we go down the highway, if we change lanes, we're supposed to signal, right? Why? Because everyone's safe when I signal. Think about that if you're a leader. If you're not signaling well or you're signaling randomly, you're creating unsafe space. You're going to get nothing but bad donuts and people that say yes. So, we're kind of out of time here. Not quite, but I think we're going to skip this exercise because how many people want lecture? That's a lot of people. How many people want activities? Yeah. Okay, I said okay, so let's go a little bit further. IBC practice, invitation-based change, open space agility. You can take this and you can load it with modern Agile as described by Josh, and you can close the curtain on the Agile theater. This is an enterprise-wide iteration where we answer the question, what just happened inside our Agile adoption? What just happened in our program for continuous improvement? How many people in this room have ever been to an enterprise-wide retrospective on the Agile adoption? Even once. Show of hands. That's not a lot. That's like two or three people. This is my number one piece of guidance to you. Go back to your organization and suggest that the whole organization take stock and do a retrospective and a prospective in the here and now to take stock of what, what the heck we're doing. We use iteration with the teams. We even use it with, you know, teams of teams. Why aren't we taking a day, or the better part of a day, in answering the question, how's our Agile adoption doing? How can we improve it? That's what this is. It starts with a big meeting that's in the open space format. I can't teach you that now. You'll have to look it up, open space technology. In between, Teams throw away things that aren't working. Programs in the portfolio level do the same thing, and they try new things. Leaders tell stories during the change. We do experiments between these two open spaces. This one, well, this one here, and this one. And we do these approximately 45 to 100 days apart. The entire process is structured. It has a beginning and a middle and an end. Have you ever been in the messy middle of something where you don't know where you, where you know you can't go back to where you were and you're not yet where you're going? Have you ever had that feeling in your life? Agile adoptions produce this feeling. It's called the liminal state. You're in a state of liminality. You're in a no man's land. When you create this no man's land, 
people become full of anxiety and stress. This structure encourages self-management and it tells a, co a coherent story with a beginning, a middle, and an end in small increments. Leadership tells stories that support the change as we move from checkpoint to checkpoint. This is what it looks like when you start an open space meeting. How many people have ever attended an open space meeting ever in their lifetime? All right, so for homework, please go and learn and go Google open space technology and learn about what it means. This is an extremely important meeting format if you want to close the curtain on the agile theater by moving into modern agility. This is it. It's the best piece of guidance I can give you at the enterprise level. Any technique that leverages invitation is an IBC technique. So here's, here's my challenge to you. I want you to go to work tomorrow, and I want, how many people here schedule meetings? Okay, so so many of us convene meetings. We are duly authorized to convene meetings. So here's my challenge to you. I want you to pick a meeting that you convene weekly, and here's what I want you to do. I want you to make that meeting optional to attend. I want you to tell everyone at the meeting that you send the invitation to that they don't have to show up unless they want to. I want you to do it as an experiment. I'm not even gonna tell you what's gonna happen because I have no idea myself, but I'm, I know, I'm pretty darn sure that what's gonna happen is you are gonna have a whole bunch of ahas, and you're gonna have a whole new uh, feeling about invitation. The people that you thought were in might not show up, and the people you thought were out sh suddenly show up. And there's something very magical that happens at the meeting that I'm gonna leave out. I want you to experience it for yourself. We are now at the end, or the beginning of the end. Everyone gets these slides. Here's some, here's some, um, some, some links. Martin Fowler wrote a very interesting essay called The Agile Imposition. He wrote it in 2006. Everyone ignored him. It was a wake-up call and a warning to the Agile community. This one here, push versus pull, pretty much elaborates on what I said, that we use push to promote pull. This is a, at odds with itself. It makes no sense. We need to use pull if we're going to encourage pull. If we're going to escape the Agile theater and close the curtain on it, we're going to have to learn more about how to really do pull at the enterprise level. Okay, I've written a set of uh, heretical, provocative uh, coaching lessons. I hope you go and look at those. And here's a very interesting um, essay from a woman named Michelle Holliday who says, software is saving us, but not in the way we expected. The software development environment and delivery environment is one of the harshest learning labs you could ever find. We're learning how to do great interactions because software is a harsh task master. And if we have messed up interactions, we have messed up code. I talk about open space in this next one as a game about authority and authority distribution. And then also invitation-based change. Here's a couple of more. They're all in the slides. We have two minutes to go. Here's the deal. Every single one of you can opt in to receive the gift of the Open Space Agility Handbook. Here's all you have to do. Go to this URL. The very first line, the very first sentence on this page says subscribe to this list. You put your name in that list before June 25, that's this Friday at midnight, Tel Aviv time, you're getting a copy of this in a Kindle edition, absolutely free with my compliments. Furthermore, if you don't have a Kindle, you can download a Kindle reader to your PC, to your MacBook, to your phone. There's Kindle readers all over the universe. You can just read any Kindle book. You don't need a Kindle to read a Kindle. Okay? So I invite you to uh, receive your gift. We're now at the end. I thank you very, very much for your time. It's great being with you. I hope I've provoked you and that you'll consider trying some of these things tomorrow. Thank you very much.